Genesis chapter 6, Satan is the adversary. Satan has tried to, in his constant, pernicious, in his evil way, he's tried to overthrow God's plan. When we come to the sixth chapter of Genesis, we find Satan coming perhaps the closest that he ever came to destroying God's plan. You see, ever since chapter 3, and just to backtrack, in chapter 3, if you remember, he is the one that enticed Eve to rebel and sin against God. She brought Adam to follow her in her disobedience, and the entire race plunged into sin. And Satan thought, ha, got him now. But in chapter 3, verse 14 and 15, God gave a promise. Verse 15 says, I'll put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed, and he, capital, shall bruise your head, and you will bruise his heel. That's the first promise of the gospel. And so Satan knew that there was some seed coming. He knew that there was going to be this promised redeemer, and so after he got mankind to go into sin, he thought Abel might be that seed, and so he got Cain to kill Abel. And the murderer from the beginning, Satan, enticed Cain to destroy his righteous brother. Self-righteous Cain destroyed faith-righteous Abel. But that didn't ruin the plan. And Eve says, I'm going to have a seed, and so Satan kept his work up. And that's where we get to chapter 6. And it says in chapter 6 that, verse 5, that God looked down at his creatures that he had created, and it says that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and every intent of the thoughts of his heart were only evil continually. And Satan had, and his minions had, and his demons had, so permeated the society of this planet that there was nothing but constant malignity and evil and wickedness coming up in the sight of God, God who looks at our hearts. But we aren't going to cover that for a moment because that was his third incursion. We're going to learn about that today. But, uh, Man survives this, you know, the flood, and Adam and Eve, uh, their descendants through Noah and his family, repopulate the earth, and God, by chapter 11, reaches down and picks one family of all the families on the earth. He picks one pagan Gentile family. There were only Gentiles on the planet, right? There were no Jews yet until God picked Abraham. And Abraham, the pagan Gentile moon worshiper, became Abraham the faithful, the father of the faithful, the Jews. Now, Jews is a derivation of Judah, and that's one of his uh, descendants, his grandson, uh, had 12 sons, and one of those 12 sons was Judah, but that's where Jews come from. In Hebrews, uh, uh, people come from a derivation of the Habiru, but we're going to talk about God's chosen people. And God picked Abraham, and through him Isaac, and through him Jacob, and through Jacob, 12 sons. And through the 12 sons, in chapter 49 of Genesis, God picks one of the 12, and he says, my Shiloh, the one that's coming, is going to come through Judah. And the scepter, the lawgiver, will rise up from him. So Satan says, ah, I know what I'm going to do now. So he decides he's going to destroy the Jews. And he gets Pharaoh to start oppressing them and start killing the firstborn. And God saves one of the firstborn and one of these young men. And he gives him a call. And Moses and his older brother Aaron are called of God to be deliverers. So what does Satan do? He gets Moses all caught up in the wealth of Egypt. So he gets him out of Egypt. So then he becomes a murderer. And he thinks he's got him set aside, but God uses him to deliver Israel. So then what happens? Israel gets into golden calf worship, and God says, I'm going to incinerate all of them. That would have wrecked the plan, wouldn't it? Because he had to have someone from Judah's descent to be the deliverer. And so God through Moses' intervention and his intercession, doesn't destroy them all. So what happens? Along comes Balaam, and Balaam pollutes them through immorality. And the intermarriage of the pagan women is going to ruin the line, the seed through which Christ is going to come. And so again, Satan thinks he's so close, but God intervenes again. And through a righteous Phineas who spears through the immoral pair that is introducing this gross worship into Israel, he again preserves the line. But then finally, Satan thinks he's got it down. He finds that Christ has come to earth. And so he incites Herod to kill all the children, but Christ escapes and is taken by his parents to 
Egypt. So then he incites the town people of Christ's hometown to try and throw him over the cliff and crash in Nazareth. But Christ walks through the midst of them. Then he incites the people of Jerusalem to try and stone Jesus, but Jesus walks through their midst. But finally Satan says, I've got him. And he takes a man from Keroth, Judas of Keroth, Judas Iscariot. And Satan doesn't realize as he enters Judas and causes him to go and make a deal with the chief priests and the Sadducees to betray Jesus Christ. He doesn't realize that he's fulfilling God's plan. You see, he has always tried to destroy the plan. He's always tried to stop the seed from coming. And at the end, when he culminates his plan to destroy the seed itself, he fulfills God's plan of redemption because Jesus Christ had to die in our place. Well, that's what Satan's been doing, but let's look at the sixth chapter of Genesis. And I want to show you when he got closest to derailing God's plan because the Lord wanted to show his grace, but he could only find one person to show his grace on, and that's Noah. And it says in verse 8, Noah alone on the whole planet found grace in Genesis 6, 8, in the eyes of the Lord. You know, Noah presents an interesting picture of Christ. We've already looked at the ark in the last few weeks, but Noah's name means rest. In fact, it's prophesied, if you want to look at chapter 5 of Genesis, verse 29, it says, and he, that's Lamech, uh, lived 120 years and, and uh, 182 years and had a son. In verse 29, he called his name Noah, saying, this one will comfort us concerning our work and the toil of our hands because of the ground which the Lord has cursed. There's a little prophecy there that Noah would be the one who would bring rest and he would be the one that would comfort us from our labors. Do you know what Christ promised in Matthew 11, 28 and 29? Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden. I will give you rest. No, it was a picture of Christ as one who brought rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and you will find rest for your souls. What Lamech promised Noah would do, Noah was just a picture of what Christ ultimately would do. Jesus is the only one that gives rest. He's the only one that gives rest for our souls. People find a lot of happiness in alcohol. They find it in various controlled and illegal substances. They find it in immorality. They find it in living the fast and loose life or the powerful life. But, you know, that's not the spiritual gift that the Spirit of God brings as fruit in our lives called joy. Happiness is just like this. You know, it just is between the highs and the lows, and it just comes and goes. But the Spirit of God gives us unending joy. It's a fruit of the Spirit. He gives us peace. He gives us rest for our souls. And Noah was a picture of Christ. Christ who said that I will redeem you from the curse of the law because it's written in the scriptures in Galatians 3.13 that everyone who's hung on a tree is cursed. And Christ who hung on a tree for us was cursed in our place that we might have the rest. But Noah not only was a picture of Jesus and the work of redemption as he was going to bring rest to a world, and he did, as God killed everyone on the planet except for Noah and his family. It was the first time there had been any rest on the planet since Adam and Eve and the, the curse and the fall had come. But Noah is also a beautiful picture of the end times because Noah and Enoch together represent the two groups that God has been working with from beginning. And Noah is a picture of Israel. Even before Israel was anything but a plan in the mind of God, Noah is a picture of Israel because Noah went in the ark and went through the flood. And did you know God is going to protect Israel through the tribulation and he's going to preserve them and no, they are not going to be able to be destroyed even though the entire world is going to be united in their desire for their destruction? So Noah is a picture of Israel being kept by the ark through the flood. Enoch is a picture of us, the church. Enoch was pulled out before the flood and taken to heaven and he didn't die. Enoch is a picture of the rapture, the, the harpazo, the snatching of the church out of this world before God pours out his wrath and before he pours out his fury upon the sinfulness of a world going after demons. And so this morning, Noah is an interesting picture of Christ who brings us rest. And I wonder this morning, do you have rest? Have you ever met Christ? Those who have gone to church all their life and have signed on the dotted line and been baptized and done all those other things that don't have rest haven't met Christ. And I wonder this morning, do you have hope that he's going to deliver you from the wrath to come? 
Do you realize that this morning, that if you're in Christ, that you're going to be like Enoch, and I'm going to be like Enoch, and we're going to be translated out of this world before the fury of God's wrath descends, before he unlocks the pit where the demon hordes have been kept, and he releases these myriads of monsters that Revelation chapter 9 talks about that are going to cause horrible, horrible carnage on this planet. You know, it says in the scripture, it says when God unlocks that pit and lets those demon warriors out, that they are going to come and they're going to sting and they're going to pillage and plunder the people of this planet. And people are going to be looking for places to kill themselves. It's going to be so horrible. Do you know what Revelation 9 calls the demon hordes? They come like locusts. And you know what's interesting? When God unleashes this horde during the time of his judgment on the earth, that those demonic creatures are probably going to be invisible? How would you like to be a worldling not knowing Christ sitting in your home and all of a sudden your front picture window smashes as something comes through it that you can't see and all of a sudden that something starts attacking you and you start being in horrible pain and you can't fight back because you can't even see what it is. That's what's going to be going on during the tribulation hour on this planet. God says Israel, like Noah, is going to be brought through unscathed. The church, like Enoch, is going to be taken out of this world and translated into the presence of Christ. Why did God send this judgment? Why did God flood the whole world? Why did God kill every human being, probably hundreds of millions, if not billions of people that were living in the pre-flood world? Why did he do that? Well, I'd like to show you, first of all, the downward slide. Point number one. Let's look at the downward slide of the flood and the world of the flood. Christ said in Luke 17, 26, just as it was in the days of Noah, so will it be in the days when the Son of Man returns. What was it like in the days of Noah? I already read to you, Genesis 6, 5. God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and every thought and imagination of his heart was only evil continually. Number one, humanity was contaminated. Man was sinful, but man was sinful, but yet they were still operating halfway decent. But by the time Noah comes around, humanity had descended to the point of utter, total wickedness in the sight of God. You say, you mean there, is, there are degrees of sin? You bet there are. Do you remember when Jesus cast out a demon? He told the man, watch out, lest something worse happen to you, lest this demon go out and get some that are even worse than him and enter you? Did you know even among demons there are good and bad demons? I don't mean good as far as good, uh, righteous. I mean that there are some that aren't as malignant as others. There are degrees of evil. Did you know even hell will have degrees of punishment? There are some people that are going to be, as Dante in his Inferno said, in the bottom. There are others that are going to be separated from God eternally in hell but they are not going to be suffering as much as those who had more exposure to the truth. There are degrees of demons and there are degrees of punishment in hell. And God saw that that the whole planet was evil continually. Humans were contaminating. But look at verse 2 of chapter 6, because the second point, not only was humanity contaminated, but demons were rampant. Now, this is unique. This is the only time in the history of the planet where God allowed this to happen. And I want to show you what happened. It says in verse 2 that mankind had become largely demon-possessed. It says in verse 2, the sons of God saw the daughters of men. Now, you know, there's some people say, oh, the sons of God are just, just uh, you know, the good people. They're just the descendants of, of Enosh. They're just the good. And, and the sons of Cain are, are the daughters of men. And they try and explain this away. But if the sons of God means anything less than something supernatural, why didn't they just say the sons of Abel's brother Enosh or the sons of the good side? Why did they say sons of God? Well, I'm going to show you in just a minute because I personally believe that the sons of God are none other than fallen angels or demons that cohabited that in some unusual way were involved in demonizing the race of mankind. An evil of man's own nature was compounded and it became too much for the Lord to bear and judgment had to come. Why do I believe that? Number one, because the purpose of this demon intrusion was Satan's last ditch effort to contaminate all of humanity. And it happened, verse 5, God saw that all of mankind was defiled, that all of mankind was utterly given over to wickedness, utterly pursuing enmity against God. 
you want to look with me for just a second at the book of Jude, the sixth verse, that's the other end of the Bible. Go to the end of your Bible. If you don't know much about the Bible, go to Revelation. And the book just before Revelation, just the whole book of Revelation, and the little tiny one page that's before Revelation is the book of Jude. And Jude was a brother of Jesus Christ. He was uh, a child of Joseph and Mary's, but he was not uh, fully Jesus' brother because Jesus didn't have a human father. But Jude was one of his four brothers. And Jesus had four earthly brothers, and uh, all of them didn't believe on him until after. Uh, and then they came around. And James wrote the book of James, was another one of Jesus' brothers, and Jude was another. But uh, Jude in verse 6 says this, And the angels who did not keep their proper domain, but left their own abode, he has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of the great day. What was the nature of this demon intrusion into society? We know what the purpose was. It was to destroy and to defile humanity. But how did it occur? Well, look at verse 5. I want to remind you, though, that once you knew this, this is Jude, verse 5, that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. So he's talking about something that happened with the Israelites, Judas. Then he talks about another event that we're looking at this morning. And he says, also, the angels who didn't keep their proper abode. How did they leave their proper abode? Look at verse 7. As Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around about them in similar manners to these, to whom? To these to whom I have already spoken of, to these angels that didn't keep their first abode, just like Sodom and Gomorrah, gave themselves over to sexual immorality and going after strange flesh. What did Sodom and Gomorrah do? I mean, it's sodomy is a derivative of the city of Sodom. And Sodom was a place where, where there was the absolute perversion of God's creative order. God created one man and one woman to live together for life. He did not create polygamy to have multiple wives. He did not create celibacy from the beginning, although God says that there are some that are celibate for the kingdom of God, and some of them just can't be married. There are physical reasons. But he said that God's initial plan was, and his perfect order was, one man and one woman to live together for life a man and a woman, to be married and to enjoy the wonders of what God has made for them. Well, it wasn't long before there were perversions to that and prostitution starts and then polygamy starts. And by the time we get to chapter 19 of Genesis, sodomy starts. And sodomy in its broadest application is not only the perversion of men that are being with men, but women with women. And what we see here is in Jude, he says in verse 7, that Sodom and Gomorrah left God's order for human sexuality and perverted it in sodomy and homosexuality. Well, now that we're talking about that, look at verse 6. Angels didn't keep their proper domain, Jude 6. They left their own abode, and he's reserved them in everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of the great day. These angels are in trouble. And they are incarcerated, awaiting a future judgment. Why? Well, if you just the commonest rendering, I mean, if you can understand what you read, if you look at verse 7, it says, As Sodom and Gomorrah went into sexual perversion, the only thing you can interpret verse 6 is, is that these angels went into sexual perversion. You say, but wait a minute, it says in, in the book of Matthew that, that angels don't marry or are given in marriage. That's right, angels. These are fallen angels we call demons. And in their malignant pursuit of transgressing God's order, they somehow inhabited, possessed the bodies of humans on earth, and somehow demonized and proliferated through the race until the earth was primarily demon-possessed, I believe, before the flood came. Well, the purpose of the demon intrusion, Genesis 6-5, was to spread wickedness. The nature of it, I believe, was a sexual uh, perversion of, of these sons of God being fallen demons. But look at 1 Peter 3. And if you don't know where 1 Peter is, just back up about five books. It goes Hebrews, James, 1 Peter, chapter 3. The demon intrusion of Genesis 6, the purpose of it, destroy the race. That was Satan's plan. The nature of it, sexual perversion. Some type of unique time where demons came down and and were involved in the, the generation of, of 
progeny that were demonized. Number three, what was the timing of this? Well, look at 1 Peter 3, because this isn't, this is talked about in the Bible. Uh, verse 18 of chapter 3, Christ suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, 1 Peter 3.18, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit. And that's a great verse. Christ suffered once, and that's why we don't believe in the ongoing sacrifice of Christ, bloodlessly or bloodily, in any religious observance. He died once. And anybody that, that promotes an ongoing sacrifice of Christ is totally against the scriptural concepts of the redemption, the atonement, the sacrifice of Christ. But look at verse 19. By whom also he went and preached the spirits in prison. Now, if you grew up in a liturgical church, they say that Christ descended into hell. And, you know, there's the, in the Apostles' uh, Creed, it, it says that. And, and people go, Christ descended into hell. And so that's why uh, some of the charismatic far fringes talk about Christ as fighting with Satan and wrestling and all this crazy stuff. No, no, no. It says he went and preached. What did Jesus do in hell? Did Satan torment him and did he suffer a hell for all of us? No, the Bible doesn't say that. He did that on the cross. What did he go down into the lower parts of the earth for? Well, right here in verse 19, he went and preached to the spirits in prison. Who are the spirits in prison? Well, look at this. Who formerly were disobedient, verse 20, when once the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah. Hey, that's a great name of God, the divine long-suffering. That's God. God's very patient. He's very long-suffering. In the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight souls, were saved through water. What's he talking about? Well, there's some spirits. They got in trouble during the 120 years while Noah was building the ark that God has incarcerated. And if you put Jude 6 with 1 Peter 3, 19 and 20, you say, hmm, maybe there's some correlation here. And so I believe that the timing of this demon intrusion was during the time, the 120 years, while God was long-suffering, waiting for mankind to repent, Satan poured out the demons and they invaded humanity. Look at 2 Peter. You're in 1 Peter. Look at 2 Peter 2 and verse 4. It's talked about again. Because if the purpose of this demon intrusion was to destroy the race so that there would be no seed, and if the nature of it was sexual in nature and a defilement of the descendants of these uh, demons cohabiting with women, and if the timing was prior to the flood, what was the result? Well, 2 Peter 2, 4. It says in verse 4, if God did not spare the angels who sinned, well, they all sinned that went with Satan. Is he, is he limiting them? Yes. But cast them down into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment. And in the same breath, what does Peter say? This links this event. Verse 5, and did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah. Okay, all I can say is this. And you know, you, this is one of those points uh, of doctrine that you have to study out. And you know what? It's not one that, that determines your eternal destiny. It doesn't even determine your orthodoxy. But I'll tell you what, it explains a lot of stuff in the Bible. And basically it's this, that Satan sent an intrusion into humanity. He sent a legion of demons in that began to infiltrate the human race. In fact, it says in Genesis 6, and you can go back to Genesis 6, with me, it says that what happens when they did this intrusion was, verse 4 of Genesis 6, there were giants on the earth in those days. And if you look at the word giant, it's the word Nephilim. You know what Nephilim means? Fallen ones. These demons, by the word, the word demon means uh, intelligence or knowledge. And these intelligent, knowledgeable, malignant spirits that know more than we do because they're in the spirit realm came down and began this intrusion and they caused giants to be on the earth. Interesting times. God says, you know what? Satan's almost done. He's almost defiled the whole race. I'm going to pull out one family that found grace in my eyes. I'm going to destroy everybody else. They're all tainted. And he didn't spare anyone. He killed every living human being on this planet, except for Noah, his three sons, and his wife, and the three sons' wives. Well, the Apostle Paul tells us that in the last days there's going to be an intrusion again. First Timothy 4.1, 1 
You can just write this down. I'll have to hasten. It says, in the last days, some will depart from the faith and they will give heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. You see, the same thing that Satan did the first time when, he, when God's judgment had to come to clean up the world, it's going to be the same thing that causes and precipitates the tribulation hour. Did you know that in the tribulation hour, there's going to be a global pursuit of demons? There's going to be a global giving over to demons. And I hope you realize that we're headed that way rapidly. It says in Genesis 6, 1, that people began to multiply. There was this population explosion. If you look at Genesis 6, 11 through 13, it says that the earth was filled with violence. It says the earth was corrupt before God, Genesis 6, 11. The earth was filled with violence. Wow, doesn't that sound familiar? Airplanes mysteriously being blown out of the sky. The Olympic, I mean, the whole world, three and a half billion people are watching the Olympics. What do they see? They see explosions. What is our society filled with? It's filled with violence. I mean, when people want to have a night out and spend a little time relaxing, they go and pay six, seven bucks and watch a movie of people getting blown up and killed. I mean, that's how our society has feasted on violence. The ancient world was filled with violence. Humanity was very advanced. In fact, I don't know if you realize, but I was at the zoo yesterday with my children. I went through the caveman exhibit. And you know what society teaches? That caveman was on the way up. You know, that, that everyone climbed out of the slime pits and finally, you know, they start, stop dragging along with their arms on the ground and, and they start walking upright and they quit swinging in the trees and they started to be human, kind of, and then they lived in caves. Did you know that's absolutely absurd? That that was on the way down? Did you know that mankind started up here? What did Cain, Cain, the first child born on this planet, what did he do? He built a city. He did not go into a cave and pull his wife in by her hair, you know, with his club. He built a city. Do you know what his children did? you know what it says in Genesis chapter 4? It says that his children lived in tents. They had livestock. He lived in a city. They played the harp. They played the flute, Genesis 4.22. They instructed people in making bronze and iron. But God saw that. God waited. Well, what's happening in the days ahead? It says in Revelation chapter 9 that mankind is going to be in the tribulation hour worshiping demons. It says that it's going to get so bad that God's wrath is going to be poured out. And in verse 20 of chapter 9 of Revelation, it says the rest of mankind who are not killed by these, these demon hordes wouldn't repent of the works of their hand, and they wouldn't stop worshiping demons and idols. And they wouldn't repent, verse 21, of their murders, of their sorceries, of their sexual immorality, or of their thefts. The last two verses of Revelation 9 tell us where the planet's heading. They're heading right back to exactly what the earth was like before the flood. Worshiping demons, murderous, Vile sorceries. You know, that's the word pharmakeia, drugs. You know, we're, we're living in a world where people are just totally controlled either by external spiritual powers they don't know about or internally induced chemicals that they can't stop. They're addicted to them. And that's where the planet's heading. Well, what about all this? What should we learn? Practically, what does the flood teach us? Number one, God always punishes sin. Be not deceived. God's not mocked. Whatever you sow, you're going to reap. If you sow the flesh, you'll from the flesh reap corruption. If you sow the spirit, you'll from the spirit reap life everlasting. God always punishes sin. Don't be deceived. Don't think you can hide it. Sin is glaringly prominent in the sight of a holy God. You can't hide it. You can't cover it with water, baptism. You can't cover it with certificates of membership or attendance. You can't cover it with anything other than the blood of Christ, which doesn't cover it. It takes it away. God will always punish sin. If you have sin, if I have sin, it's like having a hot engine with a heat-seeking missile coming straight toward it. You cannot resist the wrath of God. Number two, the flood teaches us that God always warns sinners. God gave man 120 years of warnings in the time of the flood, and mankind wouldn't listen. We talked about that last week. They scoffed and mocked. Number three, God always will save by grace. God has always saved people the same way. I just talked to someone. They, they have... 
study the Bible so intently that, that they don't see any connection between the Bible. And I think I really jarred them out of their chair when I said, did you know everyone is going to get to heaven on the same basis? God has saved everyone exactly the same by grace. People weren't saved by offering lambs and sacrifice in the Old Testament. People weren't saved by getting circumcised or being baptized in the New Testament era. Everyone's been saved the same way, by finding grace in the sight of God. The scriptures say in Hebrews 11:7, by faith, Noah, being warned of things not seen as yet, built an ark to save his house. By faith, he condemned the world, and he became an heir of a righteousness that comes by faith. God saves graciously through faith. Have you ever looked to Christ as your only hope of salvation? Because God will judge sin. And you can't escape his wrath. And I'll tell you what, it's going to be awful to be on this planet when God uncorks the bottomless pit and lets out the demon hordes that have been kept there. And they come and they, month after month, plague horribly and torment the people on this planet. And God even sends that as a warning and people won't respond to that warning. They start worshiping the ones that are persecuting them, the demons. God always expects obedience. Genesis 6.22, it says that Noah did everything that God commanded him. It says in Genesis 7.5, Noah did all that the Lord commanded him. The God who always punishes sin, the God who always warns sinners, the God who always saves by grace, always expects a response of obedience. And there are a lot of people, and there might even be one or two here this morning, you know all about the grace of God, you know about the gospel, you've just got it right here. And you never responded to it by faith. You see, saving faith is life-changing faith. Your life will change when God moves in. When he moves out of just knowledge, mere head knowledge, mere profession, and you experience possession of Christ. Well, the scriptures tell us that God is so holy that he judged sin. He's so loving he saved Noah and his family. And this morning, he's so patient that he's letting some of you who've heard the gospel so many times you can't count it, hear it one more time. i tell you what, the Bible says, while you hear his voice, harden not your heart. This might be the last time someone sitting here this morning hears the gospel. Now, you heard it coming from Genesis 6, and you heard it by way of demons being our subject we've looked at. But you just heard that Jesus Christ is our only hope, and you can only be saved by faith in his gracious gift of eternal life. His sacrifice where he gave himself in your place and in my place. I hope that if you hear Christ knocking this morning on your heart's door, that you will come to trust in him. Unless you want to stay around and be on this planet and have a heart of stone when God unfurls his fury and lets out the demon hordes. As we bow before the gracious God of our salvation, oh, Father, I pray that your spirit would have taken some part of the word that was spoken to speak to hearts. For Christians, I pray that we would be amazed at your gracious long-suffering, that we would be overwhelmed that the same conditions are beginning to multiply that caused your first destruction of this planet, and we are witnessing the onslaught of demonic, occultic, horrific times that have never been before since the flood on this planet. May we be those who keep ourselves in the love of God, that turn from sin, and that seek the Savior. In your precious name we pray, Lord Jesus. Amen.